Okay, the last speaker for this session today is Lois Adler Johnson from the North Carolina Institute of Public Health. She is a, an has an academic background in engineering statistics and epidemiology, and he tells us she tells us um, about our markdown, quarto, shiny, and so on. Uh, welcome, Lois. Thank you. Um, I know I stand between you and lunch, but this is work I'm really excited about, so hopefully I keep you awake and you can stay engaged. Um, so yeah, my background is in um, engineering, industrial engineering, specifically statistics and epidemiology, and I currently work for the North Carolina Institute for Public Health, which is an institute situated at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. We sort of like to describe ourselves as the applied or practice-based arm of the School of Public Health. So we're providing capacity building support and technical assistance to governmental public health organizations um, or even just community-based organizations across our state um, and in the United States. Um, so we often talk currently about the black box when we're discussing artificial intelligence. That's not what I mean today. Um, I'm talking about how people view me and my skill sets and the work that they are going to ask me to collaborate with them on. Um, I generally work with people in the community or people that work for government agencies that are really, really scared of data and anything quantitative related. And so they put me up on this enormous pedestal um, and they think I just do these things that they could never ever do. I know how to code, I know how to program, I know how to do um, all sorts of things that result in magic. They can communicate back to their communities. And I really appreciate how flattering that is. It really strokes my ego. I feel very important, um, but I don't think it needs to be that way. I think we sort of need to let people in on what we do and convince them that they can do this work themselves. Uh, it's, it's not just data scientists that can do this kind of stuff. So I'm here to talk to you about the uh, historically black colleges and universities, that's what HB, HBCU stands for, Health Equity Data Consortium, um, and the work that we've done sort of around that analogy I just gave, but I also realize that I'm giving this talk not in the context of the United States, and so it's possible that you need some additional historical context about HBCUs in the US, so we're gonna hope and pray that this YouTube video works. Nope. Okay, let's try one more thing. <laughs> No. But maybe you can click on the link. Below. Yeah, I could. It's fine. It's just about a minute long. Um, so basically, if you're familiar at all with American history, um, black people in our country have been the subject of a lot of racial discrimination, um, and they were not welcome in our um, higher educational institutions for a long time, even when there were um, laws that granted them access to these institutions, of course these weren't actually followed. So um, in the late, mid to late 1800s, um, historically black colleges and universities were established as a place for black people to go get a higher education. Um, and um, they still exist today. They make up, I think the statistic is 3% of all colleges and universities in the United States. However, they also produce about 80% of black judges we have in our country and around half of the black lawyers and doctors that we have in our country. So these are really, really important academic institutions. Um, so in 2022, the, the CDC funded a grant for the North Carolina Division of Health and Human Services to establish this HBCU Health Equity Data Consortium in North Carolina. Um, and you can see sort of the, the purposes of it and, and why um, they were tasked uh, to, to deliver on some things related to health equity. And a large part of that is that because of the history of these schools, um, they are often incredibly well established in their communities. They have really strong relationships to um, community-based organizations, and they're obviously promoting their spaces as safe spaces for people in the community that look like them. Um, so why was I from a person or from a predominantly white institution, that's language we often use in the US, uh, the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, why was I brought in to support this project? Um, well, a lot of these schools that you see on this slide, they don't actually have public health research programs. They have lots of other really phenomenal um, research programs, but not public health. Um, 
And so you can see us, the line is hard to see on the slide, uh, but we are up here, off in the side, we don't actually, we aren't actually members of the consortium, um, but we provided that capacity building and technical assistance support to this consortium to sort of get their feet off the ground. Um, ideally, they never need us again, right? That they sort of acquire these skills and this expertise to sort of develop these programs on their own. Um, and you can see that there's 10 universities here that are a part of the consortium, um, and there's a hub university in the middle, NCANT. They coordinate the entire project. Um, and I should also call out that while Shaw is a member institution, they also provided some capacity building support to the uh, consortium overall. Um, so this grant that sort of funded the inception of this group was for the COVID-19 impact survey, um, which I could talk a lot about if you're curious about some of the methods that we use to do this. Um, but this survey was sort of surveillance conducted in our state, aiming at understanding the social and economic impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic on households across the state of North Carolina. So we asked a lot of really personal questions Things like, um, you know, have you experienced more anxiety as a result of the pandemic? Have you lost um, a family or close friend? Um, we asked, you know, did you lose your job because of the pandemic? Did you have your hours cut back? Did you have your hours increased maybe if you were a frontline worker and you were responsible for um, sort of putting your life out there. Um, we also asked really interesting questions that would sort of help measure the racial wealth gap in our state. So beyond just asking about household income, we asked about the types of assets and debts that people had. So do you own a car? Do you own a house? And we asked them to sort of value those assets and debts so that we could come up with a wealth score. Um, so it's a really interesting tool overall. Um, so we have the consortium. Uh, they are conducting this survey, and we are supposed to provide technical assistance and capacity building report. And we're trying to think about what is a way that we can do this that sort of centers health equity. Um, one thing could be that we just do all of the data analysis ourselves, um, but that is obviously not great and not aligned with the spirit of this project. Um, so we decided to form a data analysis work group. Um, so we conducted um, a really brief survey and we asked each of the institutions that you've seen in those diagrams to identify a lead um, so that we ensured we had representation from all of the institutions. And then we asked folks how they would like to engage. As you might imagine, if any of you um, work at an academic institution, everybody has different capacities to engage in things. Um, so in addition to sort of collecting the data, because these folks, these PIs were actually attending community events, recruiting people to take the survey, um, do you have time outside of that in your coursework and your research um, to conduct data analysis? Or do you have time and interest in actually conducting some of the data wrangling of these data? Um, or do you just want to sit in on our meetings, which is totally valid or valid? Um, the other thing I'll point out is that we conducted um, bi-weekly meetings throughout the entire life cycle of the project. Um, so we didn't just wait until we had data to look at together. We met while we were still collecting data, while we were still talking about sort of the sampling methods, um, really to build sort of that contextual information and engagement early on in the project so that it would really start to pay off once we had some actual data to work with. Um, I don't really need to pitch to this group why R is a great tool for something like this, but I'll highlight a couple things that really worked out in our favor. Um, as you might imagine, gathering 10 PIs from different academic institutions that represent different fields. Um, so some worked in bioinformatics, some worked in psychology, some worked in pharmacy, um, and they're at schools, you know, that have differing access to some of these softwares. They use things like SAS, which has a stronghold in the state I live in, North Carolina, because that's where it's from. Uh, things like Stata and SPSS. 
Um, and so we decided it made sense to obviously choose something free and open source. So this is why we primarily went with R. You know these other great pieces, but I think one of the things I love the most as somebody that does a lot of capacity building and technical assistance support um, is the volume of self-learning resources that this community has created. Um, there's something really great called the R Epidemiologist Handbook that I use all the time myself and share with folks who um, are aspiring to join this field. Um, but there's also great YouTube videos and blog posts, and once you sort of hand off a list of those, you know, initial resources somebody might want to interact with, then they generally just go down a rabbit hole on Google or YouTube and find really amazing stuff and teach themselves. So I, I love, I love R. Um, I'm going to share some snippets of our work together. These are all just screenshots of some of the different R tools um, that we used, and you'll notice that I've hid some of the actual um, results of the analyses because these are still in progress and being written up, and um, these are not my data to report and share. Um, so we, of course, developed shared code. Um, so this is just a screenshot of a script. You can see we asked questions about a bajillion variables. This was a really, really long instrument. This is just a screenshot from the cleaning code. Um, but sort of being able to have something that folks could run on their own machine, and even if they weren't actually doing the analysis or the wrangling, that they could sort of create the data sets they needed on their machines was, was really valuable. Um, we also taught several workshops, so my colleague John Wallace and I, we hosted an intro to our workshop where we obviously talked about the basics of R, but we also gave an overview of Tidyverse because that's sort of our preferred um, format and language approach. Um, and then a few months later, we hosted a data analysis with R workshop where we actually walked through those bits of code that we developed for the project and have people run sort of the most important parts of it and highlighted some really key chunks. So maybe we're pulling up a specific part of our regression code so that they can conduct, you know, regression for their region's results. Um, and then finally, um, my colleague, uh, Jaquela Wallace, or Jaquela Hodges, who was a student at the time, but now works with us, um, she uh, led a workshop reporting and visualizing in R, and we decided to use Quarto as the medium for that. And participants, uh, it was open to anyone in the entire consortium, participants sort of walked away with that with a report with um, some supplemental publicly available secondary data. Um, so that was great. Um, we also developed a Shiny dashboard that I updated on a daily basis as we were still collecting data so that folks could look at their results and they could see, you know, if they zoom in on certain um, racial or ethnic groups, we're really not hearing a lot from this group. Maybe when we go to community events, we can start being a little bit more targeted in that approach so that our sample is as representative as we want. Um, but it also allowed folks to dig into the questions that maybe they were most interested in based on their own interdisciplinary backgrounds. Um, so I had one of my work group leads that was really interested in the results we saw in her region for um, if people had had changes in their eating behaviors or exercise behaviors as a result of the pandemic, sort of thinking through what might some follow-up qualitative data collection look like to those results. So just having a place internally, this was uh, password protected for the project team to go to, to sort of see how the data looked throughout. Um, we also developed our markdown reports. Um, we collected data through a Qualtrics survey, and uh, part of our sample was a convenient sample, and we offered anybody who filled it out a $30 gift card. So as you might anticipate, we had quite a bit of fraudulent responses, and so we were able to create some really interesting plotly figures to investigate some of those different um, spam metadata from Qualtrics. Um, so we could say, actually, these people are getting coded as spam, but I think that they were just using a shared tablet at a community event, for example. Um, and then finally, we developed this Quarto report that, again, was for internal use for these data analysis work group leads to sort of serve as the basis for their report writing so they could go to their region's results in these tables and start um, picking out the pieces they want to highlight in this um, sort of giant report. All right. So um, I think a lot at this conference we talk about 
how great open science is. We all can agree on that, and that R is really conducive to a great learning environment. Um, but what I wanna highlight is that when people can run this shared code and they have training that sort of orients them to it and what it's doing, they leave with hard skills, you know? So we worked with a lot of students um, who had really no quantitative data skills prior to this project, um, and they learned how to transform their own raw data, they learned how to generate de uh, descriptive statistics, which is really important in public health, this is an important skill if you wanna pursue a career in that, and also to conduct univariate regression, so they learned how to, you know, calculate those really common measures of associations um, that we use in public health. And then the Markdown, Quarto, and Shiny outputs, I think you can make incredibly beautiful things out of those, but what I loved about this project is that they didn't really serve as things that we were presenting or turning in. They served as um, thought-provoking conversation starters for um, where some real action happened across so many different people. Um, so we were able to, you know, look at the dashboard and see, oh my gosh, somebody said that, you know, they have assets valued at $3 billion, unlikely. What do we wanna do with that outlier, which you know we were able to look at together in that shiny dashboard. So um, it helped make some coding and analysis decisions. Um, it also, like I mentioned, that work group lead who was interested in some really specific questions allowed her and other members of her team to sort of brainstorm some exploratory analyses. These data were collected at the regional data or at the regional level, so you could look at your own region's information and sort of compare it to others, see how it differs. Um, and then ultimately, this served as a basis for um, dissemination too, because that was a really important part of this project to disseminate results back to the community. Um, and so if you can sort of pick some things that were interesting to you that you think might resonate with your community members based on your context, you can go to that dashboard and take a look at those data and then create your own slides outside of something like this. Um, because we convened all the time and put our heads together, I don't think this would have happened otherwise, um, but we sort of came up with this idea of a student event where all the students that were involved in this project got to present on their research they had been doing or their experience collecting data. Um, we had one student that presented on his experience learning R and then showing off some of his code and some of the analyses that he did. Um, and so I, I think it's just really powerful if you're collaborating um, with other folks, sort of the ideas that come to you because this wouldn't have happened if I was just the one doing the analyses in the background and handed off that data. Um, and so obviously coming back to this, you know, stupid kind of analogy of the black box, but I want to highlight that I think I started thinking about how this approach would help me uh, in, in my way to provide capacity building support, um, but really what it did was like make me learn a bunch of really cool things from the people that I worked with um, and resulted in these really important partnerships and relationships with folks that have a ton more experience in community engagement and dissemination. And so it sort of opened the box both ways um, and improved the quality of our work um, also bi-directionally because of that. Um, so recommendations, I think we really need to make sure that if we're data scientists, even if you're working you know, with a client in industry that you sort of break out of your silo um, because it will improve the quality of your work. Um, we need to demystify data science uh, outside of just you know, providing open source code and resources and packages. We need to help people understand that this isn't scary and that takes human beings to sort of communicate that to folks. Um, and we need to promote data democratization, which of course is not just handing somebody their data and saying it's yours, you can do whatever you want. It's, you know, having people feel like they have a part in it and that they know how to ask questions about it and use it. Um, so I highly encourage you to form data work groups. I know the project I talked about was pretty specific, but um, I have a lot of ideas about how you could do this for other projects. Um, and I also encourage you to sort of engage folks you work with throughout the entire data life cycle. So don't just drop in when it's your time to shine and do some really cool analysis and create some really cool viz to show off the results of what folks did. Um, it, it builds those really important relationships and then obviously use our um, I put together this list of data equity resources. So this is not programming specific, um, but these are resources that you can use to sort of think through some guiding principles of data equity as you do your work. Um, these slides are also available. Um, and I 
would be remiss if I did not acknowledge my amazing colleagues from the consortium. I've put these fun little stars next to the work group leads who I've been collaborating with for the past couple of years. Um, but just huge shout out to all of them, to the, the hub at a and um, And this is an amazing group of people. I'm from UNC, I'm not a member of this consortium, but I know these people. Um, and they're not interested in just doing work in North Carolina. Um, so if you're interested in collaborating with this consortium, please let me know. I know people, um, and I'd be happy to sort of connect you so that you could think through that. Uh, uh, thank you so much. That concludes my presentation. Thanks for your insights, Lois. Any questions? Yeah. yeah thanks for the presentation. Um, how do you deal with the disclosure of the very personal data in your data sets with other people? Can you say that a little bit louder? Sorry, the mic's kind of hard to hear. The, uh, <clears throat> how do you deal with the disclosure of the very personal data you have in the, in the data sets with all these other people? There's actually no personally identifying information that we collected on our participants. So um, there's, there's nothing that could sort of get out there. But all of the data was sort of housed in secure locations, and we never used GitHub. I think like future versions of this would be great, but that was kind of a, a big learning curve to add on top of a new language, and so people had copies of these codes that they could run alongside the data on their own machines. Does that answer your question? Thank you. Other questions? Thank you so much for the <coughs> presentation. I think you kind of summarized my daily work. I am uh, I'm a global data specialist in the public health sector, uh, mainly in the humanitarian sector. And uh, during this whole week, I found a lot of common. I have a like a note on the questions: Who else is in the humanitarian sector? And I think I'm the <laughs> only one, probably in this in this whole uh, conference. Um, I feel that. Uh, I feel that we both have the same work, uh, in fact, that we don't have like packages to deliver, but we have this 6,000 line of chunks of projects just because we do a lot of data collection and we want to provide information for better decision making, etc. Um, have you ever thought in your community, in your consortium on how we can um, harmonize those stuff and produce something that is deliverable for the public health sector? This is my first question. My second question is shout out to Neil Batra with the EPI, uh, EPR handbook. I think you mentioned the same one. I also work a lot with him. Um, uh, but the thing is that yes, we can provide a lot of documentations, a lot of how we can do it, but the, the concept of the black box, I think I'm still working in a black box. I didn't know that you are doing that. Uh, how we can maybe work on improving this kind of connections to understand what other people are working so we don't have to duplicate all the efforts again. Uh, yeah, I'm happy to talk uh, more after. It's yeah, I was gonna say, I don't wanna hold people up, but I think maybe we should eat lunch together and talk through some of those pieces. So thank you so much for your time, everybody. And thank you for the questions. Thank you. <laughs> thank you.